Family, I'm excited to get into our word today. Um, we are in the book of Nehemiah. Got a new sermon series called Building a Church to Rebuild a City. And we're in chapter 2, and we're going to be going through verse 11 through 20 in Nehemiah. Um, if you don't have a Bible, there should be a Bible in the pew in front of you. Uh, please take that Bible, and we'll be in Nehemiah chapter 2. It's right after Ezra. And also, if you don't have a Bible at home, this is our free gift to you. Please take it um, while you're here. Mark it up. You know, if you see something interesting, come afterwards, ask questions. And I would love for you to, as we're going through the book of Nehemiah, for you to read the book of Nehemiah and have some thoughts and interesting things that might jump out to you. But we're in chapter 2, verse 11 through 20 in Nehemiah. And it reads, After I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there three days, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what my God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. The only animal I took was the one I was riding. I went out at night through the valley gate, uh, through the valley gate towards the serpent's well and the dung and the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool, but farther down it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley gate uh, of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I entered through the valley gate and returned. The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. So I said to them, you see the trouble we are in. Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned. Come, let's rebuild Jerusalem's wall. So that, so that we would no longer be a disgrace. I told them how the gracious hands of my God had been on me and what the king had said to me. They said, let's start rebuilding. And their hands were strengthened to doing this good work. When Sanballat the Hornonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official, and Gassim, the Arab heard about this. They mocked and despised us and said, what, are you, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? I gave them this reply. The God of the heavens is the one who will grant we us success. We, his servants, will start building, but you have no share, right, or historical claim in Jerusalem. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. <sighs> the grass withers, the, flow the flowers fade, but the word of our Lord will stand forever. Father, as we sit here today, seeing how Nehemiah inspected the walls and just inspected everything going on, and then he declared the goodness of your name and all that you have done in his hand, through his presence and been gracious to him. Father, we pray right now that you are gracious to us today, that as we look and inspect all the work that we're doing as we're planning this church, that we continue to look towards you, saying your hands are with us. Your grace is with us. We pray that you would strengthen our hands, Father, and that we would commit all of our works and our plans to you. I pray right now, even as I've been preparing the sermon, that I would submit it to you, saying, Father, breathe on it. You do the work. Help me to trust in you. Help us to trust in you and submit all that we do to you because you are the author and the finisher, you are the Alpha and Omega. You are the one who finishes all things that you bring to pass. So, Father, we're praying that you would do this, that you would move, that you would show yourself mighty in this moment. I pray that as I sit here to, decree, to, to preach, that I would decrease, you would increase, I would hide behind you, and that you would speak freely through me, that I would get out of the way, and they would just see your glory. So 
Lord, we need you in this moment. More of you, less of me. See your wonderful son, Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our sermon today is called, When God's Hands Are On Your Plans. Um, interesting enough, while I was just preparing this uh, sermon, one question that kept coming to mind is, what does an architect do? You know, a, lo a lot of times we know, we might have met some people who are architects, and we have a lot of assumptions about what they do, but we never really take the time to say, what is it they exactly they do? So in my uh, faithful Google search, architects, they said they design structures such as often office buildings, businesses, stadiums, schools, malls, and houses. They may also design outdoor spaces. An architect will collect all information for a project to include site selection, environmental uh, impact, zoning laws, building codes, and access buildings for the disabled. They visit site locations to visualize their projects and prepare scaled drawings to submit to a client or employer as a designer. They also estimate building costs, material needs, and the projected time frame to complete a building. So you see, architects must know what they're doing and be well trained in all facets that comes along with building something new. They must know how to put a plan together to get the job done correctly. Interestingly enough, in our text, uh, we're picking up in Nehemiah, and so far, this brother don't look like an architect. His job has been a cupbearer this whole time, and he hasn't been trained in architect as much as we know about him. Um, yet he's moving forward with plans to build something, not because of his abilities or what he knows about building, but because of his confidence not in his abilities, but in the direction of the master architect. He, he, he sees that the master architect's hands are on his plans, and I believe this text today is going to show us how to have confidence to release our plans and dreams. Give them over. Give them over to God so that his hands can be, be on our plans, directing us to be where he wants us to be, and not for because we want to be made great, but for his glory alone. Because the Lord has a better plan than we ever will. So before we dive into the text, let's get into a quick review of where we've been. On um, week one, we were in Nehemiah chapter one. That was our sermon, Comfortable to Comforter. A uh, couple highlights of that. This took place during the time of Kislova, which is around November to December. Um, Nehemiah received the report from Hananiah uh, about the state of Jerusalem. After hearing this, the Lord broke his heart and he was moved to prayer and fasting day and night for his homeland. And he tells us that he was working as the cupbearer for the king, and he was praying that the Lord would give him favor. So that was week one. The Lord was moving this man who was in a comfortable situation to a place where he would soon be sent out to be a comforter. But then in week two, it picks up in the time of Nisan, which is roughly four months later, which is March to April. So we see that Nehemiah has been praying from December to around March and April. And through God's providence and much of Nehemiah's prayers, he found favor with the king. And he left, not with just a little bit of resources, but literally the king's armies with the best of trees, with a lot of resources and everything it would take for him to be gone for a while to go and build the wall. So we see the sign of God's favor being on Nehemiah through the king. But as soon as we see God is bringing his favor and he's giving everything Nehemiah needs to build this wall, lastly in our text last week, we get introduced to a glimpse of opposition um, who will come to stand against the word, the work of God. We were introduced to Sam, Sambalit, Sam, Sambalit, and Sambalit uh, the Heronite, and Tobiah the Ammonite, and they heard that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel, and they was extremely displeased. So today we pick up in our text, uh, it starts off with, it says, after I arrived in Jerusalem and had been there for three days, 
Before we run to those three days he's been there, we actually need to take a moment to say, well, how long did it take for him to get there? Um, The text doesn't give us exactly how long it took for him to reach Jerusalem from Susa, but many commentaries believe it took roughly four months to finally arrive at his destination. Which also shows that this wasn't a quick process, but there was quite a bit of time intervals at play already. And just in the first four chapters, we were already given month one, month four. It took four months. We're up to month eight. See, family, this, I pray as we're listening to this, this is actually encouraging to us. And the reason it should be encouraging to us, the plans you have for your life, they might take time. The things you're believing the Lord for will probably happen, but not immediately. But often it will be a drawn out process. And I just want to encourage you, this is not because of what you're doing wrong, possibly. He's not upset with you. Maybe your sins are holding things up, but maybe it's just because he needs you to grow and build He's not upset, but is leading this for your ultimate good. He's trying to produce something in you. Jesus' brother James wrote in his his epistle to the church, he says in James chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, consider it a great joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you experience various trials. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its full effect so that you may be mature and complete, lacking nothing. When it talks about these various trials, uh, this phrase isn't just because bad things are happening, but these, these various trials are just, uh, uh, it's assumed that these are the normal parts of a Christian life. The Jewish tradition, a wisdom tradition, held that the experience of trials was actually proof that a person was being faithful. And then joy in that text suggests an eschatological, which means an end times result, an end time hope of deliverance from trials. See, the joy with which we believers endure trials in the present is a sign of the hope that is to come. Before we even dive into our text, my question for you is, how have you been waiting lately? How's waiting going? Are you complaining? Are you worrying? Are you feeling like nothing's working out for your good? Are you seeking the one who's trying to produce something through you? How have you been waiting lately? See, we all have plans for our life. We all have dreams and aspirations for our life. But the Lord says, I have something better for you, but it's going to take some time. It's like a meal that's cooked slow. Slow and low is giving me the best meals every day of my life. But a quick meal is always, I've regretted it lately. How are you waiting right now? Diving back into our text, Nehemiah has arrived in Jerusalem. He's been sitting for four, three days, um, which is a normal thing. And actually we saw that in Ezra also. When he arrived, he didn't just get to work. He stopped and he waited three days. And then it says, Nehemiah, in verse 12, I got up at night and took a few men with me. I didn't tell anyone what God had laid on my heart to do for Jerusalem. And the only animal I took with me was the one I was riding. See, Nehemiah, when he got there, he knew that the Lord was doing something, but he didn't dive straight into work. Now, he waited. He didn't go around telling everybody, all right, we heal." Everybody have no fear. Nehemiah is here. He ain't do that. He was like, nah, you could. He, he waited. He didn't boast about what the Lord had instructed him to do, but actually his confidence led him to look, wait, pray. It's showing us that when we are believing the Lord for something, when he is showing us that he's going to do something in our life, we should seek the one who gave us the call but we shouldn't rush ahead to try to do what he's called us to do. But we should actually show up, be patient. I can imagine Nehemiah, he stopped and he says, okay, Lord, you laid this on my heart. You laid it on my heart to care for your people, to do this work for your glory. Let me see what's going on around here. So he walked around 
He, he took the guys out. He ain't even tell them why they're going out there. He just went out and started walking around and was surveying the land. He says, let's get a lay of the land. And as he looked at the land, he started carefully planning his next few steps. And I believe just based on the character of Nehemiah and what he's been doing this whole time, he continued to saturate everything with prayer. So I think I, I know how Nehemiah felt on those nights when he was just riding his donkey or his camel. I don't know what he was riding, but he was just riding around the city slowly. Because many nights I find myself doing something very similar. Um, and Crystal, it drives her crazy because I have a bad habit. Of, I just get up and drive. And I can literally just get up and drive for hours. Not because I got any place to do, but, but B, but just because I want to see the community. I want to see what's going on. I want to just drive and say, okay, Lord, what's going on around here? Where, where do you need our focus right now? Well, what do you need to see happen in this area? I just drive around the community and I pray. And since the Lord has put this church on my heart, that's what I've been doing literally for six years, just driving, looking, praying. Nowhere to go exactly, just looking, praying, waiting, see what he's calling us to do. Just saying, Lord, establish your presence here. Give us clarity. Help us to establish a place where people hear you and see your good works. And see, Nehemiah had this confidence, and we can have this confidence. I have this confidence because of Psalms like Psalm 127.1, when it says, unless the Lord builds a house, its builders labor over it in vain. Unless the Lord watches over a city, the watchmen stay alert in vain. In, in other words, unless the Lord is doing something, your plans and your hopes and my plans and my hopes, if it's not something that the Lord is actually going to do, we're wasting our time. But the Lord hasn't given us this time to waste, but he gave us this time to just seek him, to trust him, to look towards him. So what did he do when he was riding out? Well, he kind of gives us a breakdown of what happened. He, he first inspected the situation before making any decisions. Look at verses 13 through 15 with me. It says, I, I went out at night through the valley gate towards the serpent's well in the dung gate. And I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that had been broken down and its gates had been destroyed by fire. I went on to the fountain gate and the king's pool. But further down, it became too narrow for my animal to go through. So I went up at night by way of the valley and inspected the wall. Then heading back, I went towards, you see how he's doing? He's like, I went to this gate and I went to this gate. I went all around. He was just slowly and methodically inspecting. There's such an intentionality here. See, he was going to each gate to see the state of where they were at. Which gate need the most attention? Which one may need to be worked on first? He didn't approach it haphazardly. But he does it with a sense of reverence. Because he knows the one who's given this mission. He knows the one who has called him to carry out this assignment. If the Lord has called you to do something, you shouldn't approach it haphazardly, just doing it anyway, like I'm just going to do some stuff and see what happens. No, no. He says, do it with reverence. Do it with intentionality because we're his. Paul wrote to the church in Philippi. He said in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 13, he says, Them for my dear brothers, just as you always obey, so now, not only in my presence, but even more in my ab in absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, why was Paul telling them to work out their salvation with fear and trembling? Well, he goes on in verse 13 that says, For it is God who is working in you both to will and to work according, according to his good purpose. So Nehemiah, he was like, this is God's work at hand. This is God's thing at work. This is the, God is the one that gave this to me. So he didn't want to come at it haphazardly. And Paul is telling the church of Philippi, hey, with your salvation, you shouldn't come at it haphazardly. But work it out with fear and trembling. Because he's the one working it out. He's the one molding you and shaping you to do such good work. 
If you have dreams and hopes and you believe the Lord is calling you to something, he's saying, work at it with a reverence as though you're submitting it to the one who's given it to you. You're submitting it back as a great work unto him. How are you working on your visions right now? How are you working on your dreams? How are you working on your callings? Are you treating it as it's just a, a hobby, a thing that you kind of throw to the side and you do it, you pick it up every now and then? Or if it's something that the Lord has given you, are you treating it like, Lord, this is something you've given me and I want to present it back to you as a sacrifice, as an offering, holy and acceptable before your eyes. So that's what Nehemiah was trying to do. He's like, okay, if the Lord's called me to it, let me not just sit here and play around. But I'm going to treat it like this is the Lord's work at hand. This is what the Lord wants me to do. And then not only that, but as he was looking at the fences, looking at the walls and seeing the state they were in, he went a step further. Look at verses uh, 16 with me. Verse 16 with me, he says, The officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, for I had not yet told them told the Jews, priests, nobles, officials, or the rest of those who would be doing the work. Before Nehemiah did anything, he counted the cost. He had to check to say, okay, I, got, I know we got some priests here. We got some officials here. We got some Levites. He, he counted the cost to make sure he wasn't jumping out foolishly, but that he was moving in a way that was honoring unto God. This is exactly what Jesus has called his believers, his disciples to do. Count the cost. And Luke chapter 14, verse 28 through 33, it says, For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down? Calculate the cost to see if he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Or what king going to war against another king will not first sit down and decide if he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If not, while the other is still far off, he sends a delegation to ask for the terms of peace. In the same way, therefore, every one of you, who does not renounce all his possessions cannot be my disciples. Jesus was saying, when you follow me, you must count the cost because it costs you everything. But because it costs you everything, you will gain everything. He's like, you must count the cost for your life and for the visions and the dreams that he's giving you, the hopes that you are giving back to God. He's like, are you counting the cost for what that's going to cost you? Are you being shaped and molded for this vision and dream? Are you treating it haphazardly? Just doing stuff and waiting for something to fall in place. As God's people, we have always been told, never just do stuff and wait for it to fall in place. But he said, no, no, you do things as I would want you to do things. <laughs> My commands come out through you the same as it would come out in heaven. My works are done through my people the same way my hands would do my works. Now, God is perfect. We're not, and we will fall short. That's where grace comes in. But he tells us we must count the cost and bring everything to him. Submit everything to him. And that's what we see Nehemiah doing in our text right now. So right now he's gotten to the city. He's been kind of quiet, possibly because he didn't want to alert the, the, the opposition that's already standing up, but he wanted to see the city for himself, count the cost for himself, pray to the one who has given this work for himself before he brings it before the people. But then, going in verse 17 through 18, he said, I said, he came and stood before the people. He said, so I said to them, you see the trouble we're in? Jerusalem lies in ruins and its gates have been burned down. Before we even move forward, I love this fact that Nehemiah did not grow up in Jerusalem, but when he talked to him, he said, our home, our people, our place, this place that God has said is his, is ours, it lays in shame. 
when we're talking about church plan, we ain't saying we just go to a church in the neighborhood. He said, no, no, that's your neighborhood. This is our neighborhood. We have to be, uh, we have to be vigilant and care about what's going on, going on in our neighborhood for God's glory. We don't disassociate ourselves and say, man, stuff going over there, going on in that neighborhood. He said, no, 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 this is our neighborhood. And he has sent us as his ambassadors to make his name known. So he tells him, he says, come, let us rebuild Jerusalem's wall so that we will no longer be a disgrace. And I told them about the gracious hands of my God, how the, how the gracious hands of my God had been on me and what the king has said to me. This is a, a beautiful term right here because it's actually kind of a reoccurring, almost like a melodic note. It's like a musical note. The hands of my God is on me. The hands of my God is on me. It's actually been playing all the way from Ezra to now. In Ezra chapter 7, verse 9, he said he, when he began the journey from Jerusalem, I mean from Babylon, um, the first day of the first month and arrived in Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month, this is what he said, since the hands, the gracious hands of his God was on him. Then it says again in Ezra chapter 8, so since the gracious hands of our God was on us, and then again later on in eight, chapter 8 of Ezra, I did this because I was ashamed to ask the king for infantry and cavalry, I mean, and, and cavalry to protect us from the enemy during the journey, since we had told them the hands of our God is gracious to all who seek him. And then again in chapter 8, the arrival to Jerusalem. It says, we were strengthened by our God. Literally the same kind of rhetoric as God's hand was on us. He strengthened us. So at this moment, we're coming to this melodic note. Where once again, after five times before, it's been said that God's hands are on his people. God's hands are on his people. And he's testifying how God has changed the heart of King Artaxerxes to give the riches and treasures for them to build the wall. He says, God's hands are on us. Can I tell y'all, family, when we are moving and operating, we're seeing his favor move before us, God's hands are on us. His hands are always on his people when we're seeking his glory. We can have the same type of confidence. God's hands are on us. And the response from the people when they heard this they shouted with a loud voice. They said, let's start rebuilding. And what happened? Their hands were strengthened to do this good work because God's hands were on them. They were strengthened. Family, when we are praying and seeking God and we are making plans, God's hands are on us when we're seeking his glory. That's why the great Wise one, uh, wise Solomon wrote in Proverbs chapter 16, verse three, he said, commit your activities to the Lord and your plans will be established. Family, all of us have dreams, all of us have plans, all of us have hopes. But when we turn our plans over to God, we can turn them over to him because he's faithful to deliver. See, he's the same one who has set out a plan from the very beginning. He has always shown his faithfulness. He has always shown how faithful he is to his people. How is that? Well, listen to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3 through 5. It says, Blessed is the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens in Christ. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, to be holy and blameless and love before him. He predestined us to be adopted as sons and daughters through Christ Jesus for himself, according to the good pleasures of his will or the good pleasures of his plan. He already had it laid out. These will be my people. And when he says, these will be my people, he says, my hands will be on you. You can submit your plans to him because if you are his, he will take your plans and he will establish them. I 
Tell us the good news. He will. Submit. We can submit our plans over to him. We can submit our dreams and our hopes and our longings over to him. And he's faithful to carry them and to do good with them. Why? Because he first did good to us. He knew what your hopes would be. He knew what your desires would be. He knew what your plans would be. And he knows the plan he has for your life. Because the plan he has for your life is for his glory and your well-being. Are you willing to give him your plans, your dreams, your hopes? Or are you saying, no, nah, I, I got to figure this out. I'm going to figure this out over here. And Lord, when it's ready, I'll bring it to you. Or will you bring it to it in this raw stage and say, Lord, I don't know what to do with this. I'm believing you for so many things, but I don't know what to do with this. Take it. Use it. Establish it. He's faithful to do that. It's according to the pleasure of his goodwill because we're his children. Now here's the reality. When we submit our plans over to him, that doesn't mean troubles go away. That doesn't mean opposition goes away. See, no matter what opposition rises though, we've already been given a promise. Victory has already been won for God's people. Listen to this conversation between Sam Ballot, Nehemiah, and, and whoever else is around. When Sam Ballot, the Hornonite, Tobiah, the Ammonite official, and Gazim, the Arab, heard about this, they mocked and they despised us and said, what is this you're doing? Are you rebelling against the king? Literally meaning, Artaxerxes Ar also already said, y'all can't rebuild that now. But remember, Nehemiah done got favor with the king because of the Lord's hands being on him. So Nehemiah can now confidently stand before him. He said, I gave them this reply. The God of heavens is the one who will grant us success. We, his servants, will start building. But because you're against us, because you're standing basically against God, you have no share. Right? A horse historic claim in Jerusalem. Family. When we stand with the God of heaven, who can stand against us? Who can stop us? When we know that our lives are in his hand, what can actually stop us? Who can oppose us? Because God is all for his own glory. And his glory was revealed through how he cares for his people and how his people carry out his mandate in this world. That's why Paul can write so boldly in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 54 through 58, when this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will, be, will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And he finishes off, says, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor is in the Lord, is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain family your dreams your hopes if they are for god's glory they are not in vain and when the opposition comes against them you can stand boldly and say death where you sting at i already know where my victory is found i already know who has won the victory on my behalf my plans have already been established by the one who first established all plans through himself the alpha the omega the beginning the end the author and the finisher he is the one who has established life on earth for his people. My question for you is if your plans are far away from his plans, are you his? The reality is the reason that many of our plans are contrary to his plans is because our life is not in his hands. But if our life is in his hands, we cannot go and stray away from him. But he brings us back. He gives us security. He holds us tight. He said, you can't get away from me. And I will let everything fall around you that you think is for your good so that I will be glorified in your life. 
My question is, is, are you his? And if you are his, are the plans that you have, the plans you're submitting to him, are these things that you want to hold on to? Have your dreams and visions become idols? Are you looking for your hope outside of him? If you're looking for your hope outside of him, family, I want to just tell you, today is the day you must repent. You must change. You must give up everything and say, King, it's yours. I have no claim to it. I just want the life that you offer. And the beauty is that life has been found for us. How has it been found for us? Because the one who had a plan from the beginning, the one who said he was crucified before the foundations of the earth, he stepped down before you and I ever existed. He took it on himself. He took our sins, our shame, everything that separated us from a holy God on himself. He he, he, he literally took the punishment we rightfully deserved. He took our shames and then in place for all who accept them, he he wraps us in righteousness. It's it's the foolishness of the cross that the place where death is found is where we literally receive life. The place where he has been exposed is where we are covered. This was the plan from the foundation that many will come to him and receive of this good news. And I put this out there and said, will you receive this plan that was put out there for you to be made whole and righteous before a holy God? For a sinner, an enemy of God to literally be welcomed in, not just as a friend, but as family. Welcome to the table. See, he is trustworthy with our plans. He is trustworthy with our hopes. He is trustworthy with our desires because he is a trustworthy God who has a better plan for us, who has a better plan and a better dreams than we could ever imagine for us. Will you accept him today? Will you respond to him today? So family, I I end on this. You know, I like to give us a sticky note, something to leave off so that we will remember throughout the rest of this week. When God's hands are on your plans, this is what he does with them. He will use them for our truest well-being and for his ultimate glory. He uses our plans when we give them over to him for our well-being and for his glory. And sometimes he does that by making things not go how we planned it to go. Sometimes he does that by actually taking those plans and dropping them and saying, here's a better one. But at the end of the day, it's truly for our well-being and for his ultimate glory will you receive the one, as I said earlier, the master architect, the one who is making all plans, who is counted the fullest cost, and yet he has lavished us with the truest riches. Will you receive him today? Will you pray with me? Father, you are Alpha, Omega, beginning in the one we can trust to trust in, the one we can look to, the one we long for, the one who is making all things new. You are You are him. Father, today I pray that these words were not have not fallen on deaf ears, but that you have sparked our lives. You have brought us back to life. You have helped us to see that the plans you have for our life are plans to take care of us, to prosper us, to see us flourish as your children. Father, I repent for the days when I think I have better plans than you have, but I am so thankful that you have let my foolish plans fall apart in front of me so many times so you can see, so I can see that you are truly the one in control and you are truly glorifying yourself in my life.
I pray for your people today that we will look to you, that we would trust in you, that we would be like Nehemiah, going with our plans and, and treating them with reverence, carrying them out with fear and trembling, knowing that you are the one who are establishing our steps. I pray for those who may not know you yet, Father, that you are drawing them closer to yourself that they are seeing you high and lifted up. They are knowing that the plans that you have for their lives is the best plans they will ever receive. So Father, receive this prayer today and receive our worship today as a wonderful offering to glorify yourself. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.